All right, everyone, thanks so much for coming. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jake Arnoff, an amazing and exceptionally productive postdoc who joined the Center for Evolution and Medicine in June 2023. Dr. Arnoff is an expert in immunology, metabolism, inflammation, and the new burgeoning area of immunometabolism. Uh, Dr. Arnoff earned his postdoc at Northwestern in December 2012, 20, sorry, December 2022. And despite having only earned his PhD about, what, a year and a month ago, he already has six peer-reviewed peer publications, five of which are first author, plus six more manuscripts in various stages of peer review. I keep telling him, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but he seems determined to, you know, just speed run this postdoc. Expected his current rate, probably full professor by 2026 and university president by 2030 or so. Now, beyond all of his exceptional academic accomplishments, he's an avid hiker, hiking most evenings, and he's one of the nicest humans I've ever met. So without further ado, why don't you take it away, Jay? Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, okay, uh, so odds are uh, most of you, or maybe all of you have heard a lot about inflammation. A lot of people are talking about it these days as kind of being the, the root of all evil, being implicated in all sorts of health risks, uh, various cancers, heart disease, uh, brain aging, uh, et cetera. Um, but what we know about inflammation and health comes from a pretty limited perspective. Uh, it comes from uh, modern Western populations where the inflammation we tend to experience is chronic, uh, sterile, it's not being typically driven by an acute uh, infection, uh, and low grade, only slightly elevated. Um, and this type of inflammation is largely due to lifestyle factors like diet, lack of physical activity, um, which contributes to the accumulation of adiposity fat tissue viscerally in the midsection, which is very pro-inflammatory. And it's this kind of inflammation that contributes to the chronic diseases of aging, like cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and related dementia. Uh, and so a, a primary question that motivates my research here at ASU is, what does uh, the effect of inflammation have on health and aging in environments and lifestyles closer to those that humans evolved in, uh, where people are very physically active, have healthier diets, um, and inflammation is mostly uh, due to infections. And just a, a quick caveat uh, for this presentation, I just want to clarify that no one population represents the population um, in experiencing environments and lifestyles that humans evolved in, um, but we do know that modern Western lifestyles are evolutionarily novel. Uh, and so the work that I do here, uh, working with Ben at ASU, um, is understanding uh, the health of the Chimane, a, a population of forager farmers in the Bolivian Amazon. They rely on a subsistence strategy of uh, mostly slash and burn horticulture, hunting and fishing. Um, they don't have access to running water and only recently a few communities have gotten access to electricity. Uh, and so there's wide variation in, but relatively low levels of market integration, Spanish speaking, access to medical care, although the population is currently in flux and that is shifting in recent years. Uh, and so this is part of a very large project called the Chimani Health and Life History Project that's been going on for over 20 years now. Um, and there's a lot of community engagement as part of the project, uh, including a mobile medical team that provides a high level of uh, medical care uh, to everyone, regardless of participation in the study. Uh, the project is also partnered with a nonprofit called the One Pencil Project, led by Helen Davis here at uh, ASU to provide school supplies uh, and scholarships to universities. Um, there's also work uh, that Ben does with the Bolivian CDC to monitor neglected tropical diseases that affect the Chimane. Um, and then there's also humanitarian work, such as when major flooding happens, as well as stepping in to help uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, and there's also some capacity building, including um, training and hiring of Chimane and Bolivian uh, anthropologists, physicians, uh, and biochemists, as well as uh, people who work uh, on logistics of the project. Um, and so again, this is a, a massive project that involves many collaborators across institutions, um, and uh, has multiple directors, with uh, Ben being uh, one of the co-directors. Uh, and then also many collaborators here at ASU, uh, many of which are here in this room. Uh, and then re in recent years, the project has also incorporated the Mosa 10, a neighboring population who were uh, genetically and linguistically the same population until missionary contact around 300 years ago. 
And they now experience a different lifestyle. They have indoor plumbing, they buy market foods, they speak Spanish, um, but there's still high levels of physical activity and still live in a, the same general environment. So if you think of a spectrum of, of lifestyles and environments of exposure, and you compare the Chimani on one end to the US on the other end, uh, the most of 10 are in the middle, but closer to the Chimani side. Uh, and so an outline of what I'm going to be discussing today um, is three different areas. The first being the relationship between inflammation and cardiometabolic health in these populations. The second being the relationship between inflammation and brain aging. And the third, looking at the topics of inflammation and immunosenescence, essentially aging of the immune system itself. And so a bit of background, uh, the Chimane diet compared to the U.S. is low in saturated fats and processed sugar high in fiber and omega-3 fatty acids, so um, relatively lean uh, diet. Also a recent study, uh, or actually a study that's in the works led by Dan Cummings looking at physical activity steps per day in the Chimane has found that uh, the Chimane on average walk over 16,000 steps uh, per day. And that's compared to the US average of 5,000. So the Chimane are three times as uh, active as the average uh, US person. And so unsurprisingly, obesity and hypertension are rare. Um, markers of cardiometabolic risk like total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and glucose are significantly lower in the Chimane compared to the US. Uh, an additional measure of cardiovascular health is coronary artery calcification, or CAC. So the coronary arteries supply blood to the heart. And over time, as you age, calcium builds up in these arteries uh, just from wear and tear from use. Uh, but this is exacerbated by lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, uh, and CAT contributes to uh, heart disease risk. And so CAT can be measured non-invasively with a CT scanner. And so this was done a few years ago uh, in the Chimane using a CT scanner at a nearby medical facility. And so just for reference, uh, these are some values from U.S. white men uh, looking at calcium scores for different percentiles across age classes. And so if you have any calcium, if you have any CAC, you technically have heart disease, although values of a few hundred are sort of uh, when you should really start to see a doctor. Around three or four hundred is when you definitely need to be seeing a doctor and, and getting that treated. And so you can see that for the 50th percentile, the average U.S. white men, when they're around 70, 75 years of age, they really need to be seeing a doctor and getting their CAC uh, treated. And so this is compared to Chimane men, uh, where there's extremely low uh, CAC compared to the U.S. Um, and then similarly, uh, uh, being comparisons in the women, not quite as dramatic of difference, but still a major difference in CAC prevalence. Um, and so around 15% of Chimani have any CAC compared to 86% uh, in the U.S. having CAC. And then moderate levels of CAC, where uh, you might be a little concerned, uh, under 3% in the Chimane compared to 50% in the U.S. And then high-risk CAC, when you definitely need to be seeing a doctor and getting this treated, about 40% in the U.S. compared to virtually no one in the Chimane. Um, having said all that, the Chimane experienced tons of inflammation, uh, but this is due to infection. So 70% of a Chimane adults at any given time are infected with helminths or worms, primarily being hookworm and roundworm. 30% uh, are infected with Giardia, a gastrointestinal bug, and 20 to 30% are dealing with a respiratory infection at any given time. Uh, and so uh, what I have here are comparisons between Chimane measures of inflammation compared to the U.S. And these are ratios, so one being pretty similar levels. Uh, and this was a, a large survey of immune function done a while ago led by Aaron Blackwell. Um, and you can see that for the vast majority of measures of inflammation, the Chimane are higher than U.S. data. And on the far left is IgE, which is produced in response to helminth infection. And the Chimani are basically off the charts. They're 100 times higher uh, in IgE compared to um, average US values. 
Um, and so then this raises the question of how does this kind of inflammation affect cardiometabolic health? Um, so some observations, infections increase basal metabolic rate, the energy that you're expending at rest. Um, you're burning calories just with your immune system fighting the infection. That includes fevers, which burns calories. Uh, multiple studies have found that in Shimani children, inflammation is inversely associated with growth. A study uh, over a decade ago found that elevated inflammatory markers, including interleukin-6 or IL-6, C-reactive protein, CRP, and IgE, uh, were all associated yeah, with to pay uh, to the lines of lower social. total cholesterol. Um, and then I'm also, just sort of as an aside, I've recently been uh, looking at APOB, which is kind of the, the new and improved measure of cholesterol-related health risk, and the results are looking pretty similar. Um, and so in addition to your immune system burning calories, fighting the infections, uh, parasites like helminths will also consume your calories that you're not getting. Helminths will consume your circulating blood, uh, glucose, and lipids. Uh, and so this raises the question is, could this kind of inflammation then be protective for cardiometabolic health? And that brings me to the first study. Um, where I looked at associations between a host of inflammatory markers measured in serum to see how they were associated with CT scan measures of CAC, as well as uh, liver density and epicardial fat, these measures of visceral adiposity. And so just a, a bit of background um, in terms of liver density. So lower liver density means greater fat infiltration in the liver, so greater visceral adiposity. Uh, this is not good. It contributes to insulin resistance and heart disease risk. Um, and then epicardial fat is a, a fat deposit around the heart, uh, which again is, is not good, contributes to cardiometabolic uh, disease risk. And so both of these me were measured with a CT chest scan. And then the measures of inflammation included C-reactive protein, CRP, IgE, and then uh, a panel of various cytokines, which are immune signaling molecules that include IL-6, which you might have heard of because it's commonly measured, as well as some other measures you might be less familiar with um, that are produced as part of the immune response to helminth infection, including interleukins 4, 5, and 13. Uh, and so a little bit of a background on the nuances of, of CRP, because you might have heard of it. It's commonly measured as part of routine blood work. Um, because it's considered a risk factor for cardiovascular disease uh, in the U.S. Because uh, in the U.S., it's primarily produced uh, due to excess adiposity. Uh, however, it's also a general inflammatory marker, so it can be elevated in response to excess adiposity, and it can also be elevated in response to infections. Um, and so in comparing CRP and the Chimane uh, to the U.S. data, uh, on average, Chimani adults have fairly similar levels of CRP to uh, people in the U.S., but the causes of the elevation differ. In the U.S., is primarily due to excess adiposity. Uh, in the Chimani, a lot of it is due to infections. And so when it's caused primarily by adiposity, we would expect it to be associated with worse cardiometabolic health. But it's being driven primarily by infections. We could expect it to actually be an indicator of better cardiometabolic health, like that study I mentioned earlier, where higher CRP was associated with lower cholesterol. Uh, and then also interleukin-6, which you might have also heard of, is an upstream regulator of CRP, and it's similarly produced both in response to excess adiposity as well as infections. And the comparison of the U.S. data is still in the works. It requires some additional lab validation. Um, but just as an aside, uh, in the sample that I'm working with, almost everyone had elevated IL-6, so it's generally elevated in the population. Uh, and so for just some des descriptive statistics for this study, um, I'm working with a sample that spanned ages 40 to 94 years. And in the Chimani, the sample sizes ranged 434 to 496, depending on the measure. Uh, and then the MOSA 10, the, the sample size ranged from 342 to 359, uh, depending on the measure. And so looking at uh, one of the first results that stood out, and so what this is, uh, these are regression model coefficients. That's what the dots are with 95% confidence interval bands. And then that dotted line at zero is, is no association. So you can see for the most of 10, there's a lot of overlap with that zero. So you'd say no association in the most of 10. Uh, but in the Chimane, IL-13 is positively associated with liver density, which again, greater liver density means less fat infiltration. So that's good. 
um, and IL-13 is produced as part of the immune response to helminth infection. So some initial evidence in the Chimane at least um, that the immune response to helminths might be having some protective effect on visceral adiposity. Um, although IgE is another marker produced in response to helminths, uh, the results were pretty much null um, for that one. Uh, but then looking at IL-6, so some weak associations, but negative associations in both populations between IL-6 and liver density. So greater fat infiltration into the liver being associated with higher IL-6. So suggesting there is a little bit of this adiposity-driven inflammation in both populations. And then looking at CRP, the results are uh, more dramatic. Uh, again, suggesting that there is some of this visceral adiposity-driven inflammation in both populations, um, but more so in the MOSA-10, which is what we would expect because they have more market integration and a little bit more adiposity. Uh, and then similar results with CRP and epicardial fat. So this is reverse, where higher is bad, more epicardial fat. Um, and so in the MOSA-10, again, we're seeing this clear positive association between more epicardial fat and higher CRP, again, suggesting there's some of this adiposity-driven inflammation going on. Uh, and then looking at IgE, the associations were kind of weak, but in the expected direction of higher IgE being associated with lower epicardial fat in both the Chimane and MOSA-10. Uh, and then looking at this cytokine IL-1-beta, which I'll, I'll explain in a second, um, we're seeing only in the Chimane higher IL-1-beta being associated with lower epicardial fat. And so what is IL-1-beta? It's another one of those general markers that's produced in response to a variety of things, including excess adiposity, but also infections. And when it's produced in response to an infection, it's an important cytokine for generating a fever. And so that might be suggesting that in the Chimane, IL-1-beta might be elevated in response to an acute infection, uh, inducing a fever, which is burning calories, which might be protective for cardiometabolic health. And so what about CAC? So in the sample that I'm working with, about 13% of Chimane have any CAC compared to 18% in the Chimane, slightly higher again, as we would expect. Um, and so I'm gonna show some models predicting the odds of having coronary artery calcification. Um, and again, the, the cytokines involved in the immune response to helminths are coming up um, where in the Chimane, there's this clear association between higher IL-4 and lower odds of having CAC, again, suggesting a, a protective effect. Um, and then the MOSA-10, IL-5, and IL-13, there is a slight negative association uh, with odds of having CAC. Um, so again, possibly suggesting some protective role of this uh, inflammation that has to do with helminth infection. Uh, and then looking at IgE, they're in the expected direction, but pretty weak associations of higher IgE being associated with lower odds of CAC. Uh, around 400. Yes. Uh, between four, so between four and 500 is for the Chimane, uh, over 300, around 350 for the most of them. These analyses, like on this slide, that's, uh, so the one of the three different IELs, uh, that was age, sex, and the single IL each regression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. And so then, uh, looking again, uh, so looking at IL-6, um, it's consistent with the findings for liver density and epicardial fat, or in the most and higher IL-6 associated with higher odds of having cat. So again, suggesting there's some of this uh, adiposity-driven uh, inflammation going on in the most of um, And then looking at CRP again, some slight evidence of adiposity-driven inflammation, uh, but weak associations with CRP and odds of having cat. So what do all these results mean? Uh, so there appears to be some amount of adiposity-driven inflammation in both populations, uh, more so in the MOSA-10, which is what we would expect based on their greater market integration uh, and higher adiposity in CAC. Um, and so it, it's likely a limited amount, uh, which could explain the apparent negligible health effects and the, the favorable cardiometabolic profiles. Um, and then at the same time, there is some evidence of this infection-driven inflammation uh, that could be having a protective effect on cardiometabolic health 
more so in the Chimane, which again is what we'd expect because of their slightly higher pathogen burden. Okay, and then uh, moving on to the next section, inflammation and brain aging. Uh, so a recent study looked at the prevalence of dementia in the Chimane and Mosa 10 and uh, found that it's pretty rare, um, lower compared to the U.S. and Europe and other populations. And you might think maybe there's some survival bias going on. And so there's another recent study looking at brain volumes, which brain volumes decline with age. And so they can serve as this measure of brain aging. Um, and comparing the Chimane CT scan measures of, of brain volume compared to U.S. and European data. And so for similar ages, the Chimane tend to have higher brain volumes than U.S. and European data, again, suggesting a slower rate of brain aging. And so while lifestyle factors likely play an important role in the, these population differences, uh, it does raise the question of does the high pathogen burden have any effect on brain aging? Uh, and it's reasonable to think that there would be an effect because uh, there's been numerous studies showing associations between infections and impaired cognitive function. Uh, there's multiple plausible pathways this could be happening through, such as the immune system burning calories that don't make it to the brain, uh, helminths consuming circulating glucose and lipids that don't make it to the brain, uh, as well as infection-induced anemia, which could disrupt the brain's oxygen supply. Um, also, viruses have been implicated in brain aging. Uh, they could potentially contribute to the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, as well as inducing inflammation in the brain. Um, and so moving on to, to this study, looking at CT scan uh, measures of brain volume, uh, the sample sizes were a little bit smaller, uh, but ranging from 345 to 411 in the Chimane, and then 329 to 346 in the Mosa 10. Um, and so again, uh, one of the cytokines that is involved in the immune response to helminths is, is coming through where here higher IL-5 is associated with lower brain volume, uh, but surprisingly it's actually in the MOSA-10 rather than the Chimane. And then the same thing showed up with IgE, another one of these helminth related immune markers, where surprisingly it's actually in the MOSA-10 where we see a clear uh, association between higher IgE and lower brain volume. Uh, and then IL-15, which I'll explain in a second because I haven't mentioned it before, but uh, this was another cytokine that, that came through um, where higher IL-15 in the Chimane was associated with lower brain volume. And so what is IL-15? It's, it's another cytokine. All cytokines serve multiple functions, but uh, one of the functions that IL-15 serves is part of viral defense. And so this might be an early indication uh, that viral infections are influencing brain aging in the Chimane. Uh, and so then I wondered about gray matter versus white matter, because they're both lumped together in total brain volume. Uh, gray matter uh, is neuronal bodies. White matter is myelinated, myelinated axons. It's made largely of lipids, and it helps the signals travel faster between neurons. Um, so white matter turns over frequently. It's essentially easily replaceable. Uh, gray matter atrophy tends to be permanent, and so obviously more consequential to aging. And so I looked ag again at the IL-5 association in the MOSA-10 to see if maybe it was just white matter, not gray matter. And basically the results suggested that both gray matter and white matter are negatively associated uh, with IL-5 in the MOSA-10, although maybe slightly stronger of an association uh, with white matter, although the, the associations are pretty similar. Uh, and then again with IgE, it's sort of both gray matter and white matter, although maybe slightly stronger in association uh, with white matter. Uh, and then finally, looking at the IL-15 association in the Chimane, where pretty much equally, it's both an association between higher IL-15 and lower gray matter uh, volume and white matter volume. Uh, and so to conclude, uh, there's some evidence of this helminth-driven helminth -driven inflammation contributing to accelerated brain aging, uh, but it's surprisingly uh, among the MOSA-10. And there's maybe some slight evidence of this association being stronger in white matter compared to gray matter, um, so maybe potentially suggesting some sparing or prioritizing of gray matter. 
uh, and then the inverse association between IL-15 and brain volume among the Chimane um, might be suggesting that viral infections are playing some role in brain aging uh, in this population. Uh, and then moving on to uh, the last major section, inflammaging and immunosenescence, uh, which refers to basically the aging of the immune system itself. Okay, so what is inflammaging? Um, it's sort of a popular uh, key term that's showing up. Uh, it refers to chronic low-grade inflammation that increases as you age from a variety of sources, not just adiposity, um, essentially uh, just damaged, dysfunctional aging cells, uh, will drive this type of inflammation, um, as well as latent viruses, viruses that your body never quite clears, but they keep hanging around. They start wreaking havoc on your cells. That can also contribute to this inflammaging, also uh, leaky gut, gut permeability. Um, inflammaging is seen in centenarians, uh, very long-lived individuals. There's also some evidence of inflammaging across species. Uh, so it seems to be this universal feature of aging uh, and yet it seems to pose a health risk for some people and not others. And so uh, one of the questions is, is how do we understand what, what is inflammaging that might be healthy and protective and sort of doing its job and what is inflammaging that is potentially pathological? Uh, and so uh, one of the explanations here is the relationship between inflammaging and what's also been called anti-inflammaging, that you see an increase in pro-inflammatory signaling uh, as you increase in age, but you also see a compensatory increase in anti-inflammatory signaling. And so it creates this basically well-balanced, counterbalanced immune response that's just doing its job. It's taking care of damaged uh, cells, clearing out dysfunctional cells. Uh, this is in contrast to uh, individuals who might just see more of an excessive increase in inflammation relative to anti-inflammation, uh, which might uh, contribute to morbidity and mortality risk. Uh, and so then a basic question I had is, is what does inflammaging look like in the Chimane and the Mosa 10? And so I focused here on some very commonly used measures, including CRP, IL-6, IL-1-beta, and TNF-alpha, and uh, the anti-inflammatory IL-10. And so the sample sizes were larger for this, because I wasn't restricted to those who also happen to have a brain CT scan. Um, so I'm working with over 1,000 samples from over 700 individual Chimane for the cytokines, over 1,300 samples from almost 800 individuals uh, in the Chimane for CRP, and then in the MOSA 10, um, close to 400 individuals with a little over 400 samples, just looking at associations with age. Uh, and so with CRP, uh, in both populations, there's a positive association between age and CRP, suggesting there's some of this inflammaging uh, going on and at a fairly similar rate between the populations. Uh, and then in addition, IL-6, uh, a little bit more complicated of an association, but generally in later life, an increase in IL-6 in both populations, again, suggesting that some inflammaging is going on. Uh, and then IL-10, there's a clear increase uh, with age or age is positively associated with IL-10 in the Chimane and then positively associated with age in the MOSA-10, at least to some extent. So suggesting that there also is this increase in anti Um, But then with the other two markers, there's some clear differences where in the Chimane, or sorry, in the MOSA-10, there's this clear positive association between age and IL-1-beta and actually a slight negative association with age in the Chimane. And then in TNF-alpha, uh, there's no association with age in the Chimane. And then in the MOSA-10, there's a positive association between age and TNF-alpha. And so, so what does all this mean, tying back to this inflammaging versus anti-inflammaging? Um, so CRP, IL-6, and IL-10 were all positively associated with age in both populations. Uh, but IL-1-beta and TNF-alpha were only positively associated with age in the MOSA-10, essentially suggesting there's more of this inflammation going on in the MOSA-10 compared to the Chimane. Um, and so the health implications of this are, are currently unknown. And so um, I'll be able to, to test that in future follow-ups to understand what are the health implications of these differences with IL-1-beta and TNF-alpha.
Um, and so then uh, moving on to immunosenescence, which is the other side of inflammaging, which refers to uh, declines in immune function in later life. Your immune system becomes less effective in fighting infections, as well as preventing uh, tumor growth and cancer. Uh, and this was an area that I was uh, working on right before I came here uh, to ASU. Um, and so how do you measure immunosenescence, or sometimes it's just called immune age? Uh, one method is to look at the composition of T cells. So you have naive T cells, which have not yet been exposed to a pathogen. And so these are important for defense against uh, new encounters with infections. And these decrease with age, uh, just from encountering a pathogen. And so then they're no longer naive, they become targeted to that specific infection. Uh, there's also involution of the thymus. It's an organ that's critical for the development and maturation of T cells. This progressively turns into fat tissue over time. Um, so it further contributes to declines in naive T cells uh, as you age. And at the same time, there's an accumulation uh, during aging of these late differentiated CD8 T cells, uh, which are responsible for destroying infected uh, or potentially cancerous cells. And basically these cells just over repeated activation over time become less responsive. Uh, and so the work that I was doing before I came here to ASU was to, to look at immunosenescence uh, in a place called Cebu, Philippines, as part of this, this large project uh, called the Cebu Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey, which was a, a, a large birth cohort that began in 1983 with the recruitment of over 3,000 pregnant women across rural and urban neighborhoods throughout metropolitan Cebu. Uh, the original aim of the project was to understand infant feeding patterns and how this related to nutrition and health. Um, but the project has been expanded and, and, and continued on over the years uh, through collaborations between the University of San Carlos and professors and researchers there in Cebu uh, with professors at UNC Chapel Hill, like Linda Adair, um, as well as Northwestern University uh, and, and my former advisors, Chris Kazawa and Tom McDade. And so what I was interested in was uh, the relationship between the social determinants of health and immunosenescence. Um, so lower social class, lower social status is associated with greater morbidity and mortality risk. Um, this has been studied for a long time, widely observed, um, not only in humans, but in other social mammals as well, as Noah Snyder-Mackler has written about. Um, and the biological pathways linking social inequality to health uh, are incompletely understood. Um, but immunosenescence in recent years has been one of those pathways that's, that's gaining attention um, with the recognition that lower SES tends to be associated with greater pathogen exposures throughout your life. And this could be contributing to accelerated immune aging. Um, and this has been found uh, associations between lower SES and accelerated immunosenescence based on these measures of T cell, different T cell uh, abundance it's been found uh, across multiple studies in the U.S. In the Health and Retirement Study, which is a very large nationally representative study of U.S. older adults, as well as uh, some smaller separate studies have also found this. Um, and so then I wondered, uh, what about Cebu? Do we also see it here? Uh, and so what I focused on was this follow-up in 2005, where the moms of the birth cohort were ages 35 to 70 years old. Uh, the birth cohort uh, was 20 to 22 years old. Uh, and this uh, round of data collection included whole blood samples. And uh, last a few years ago, um, the project got a, a large NIH grant led by Chris Kazawa to measure DNA methylation in slightly over 1,000 of the moms and over 1,700 in the birth cohort. And so why am I bringing up DNA methylation? Um, you might have heard of DNA methylation because it's used for the calculation of epigenetic clocks or epigenetic aging, if you've heard of that, these measures of biological age. Uh, so DNA methylation basically refers to these chemical tags along the genome that help uh, regulate the activity of genes. And when you measure DNA methylation in a blood sample, one of the biggest contributors to variation in DNA methylation is the composition of immune cells. Different immune cells will have slightly different DNA methylation patterns because that's one of the mechanisms that regulates their genes and allows them to remain that type of cell and function as that type of cell. Uh, and so bioinformaticians have taken advantage of this information to create predictive models called cell deconvolution 
where you can take a blood sample uh, with DNA methylation and you can estimate the immune cell composition in that blood sample. And very recently, a group has developed a, a cell deconvolution method to estimate the, the proportions of naive T cells and late differentiated CD8 T cells. And so that's uh, what I used here. Um, and so I was curious in the, the, the moms of the birth cohort, how was SES uh, as, as a composite of education, income, and assets, how was this associated with the T cell composition to get at immune aging? Um, and so similar to what's been found in the US, higher SES was associated with higher naive T cells uh, and lower of these late differentiated CD8 T cells. So replicating what's been found in the US suggesting that um, higher or lower SES is associated with accelerated immune aging. Uh, and then I also wondered about early life SES because there's some evidence uh, based on US studies that early life SES could have a lasting effect on immune aging later in life. Um, there's some plausible pathways, but this isn't really understood currently of how this could happen, such as early, early life insults like uh, viral infections, pollutants, uh, nutrition, stress. Um, and early life is a, a sense, could be a sensitive period for the development of the immune system. Uh, for example, in the first six months of life, that's when you're really developing your wide pool of different T cells. Um, and so early life insults in this window could potentially have um, some lasting effects on your immune function and, and by extension, immune aging. Uh, and so then I, I looked at this SES uh, in the birth cohort, comparing SES at birth to SES uh, in adulthood. And so when they're both included in the model, they're both independently associated with the naive T cells and the late differentiated CD8 T cells, suggesting uh, both the effect of early life SES as well as current SES. And the basically the associations for adulthood SES were barely stronger, but uh, judging, judging by the uh, confidence intervals overlapping a lot, pretty similar associations uh, comparing uh, early life SES and adulthood, suggesting the importance of both these potentially lasting effects as well as the importance of current SES. Um, and also suggests that this gradient emerges well before later life. It's emerging uh, ages 20 to 22 years. Um, so well before, you know, when we think about aging. Um, and so a new wave of data collection uh, is gonna be wrapping up now almost 20 years later. And so I'll be able to see what is the health relevance of immune aging in Cebu. Um, and so tying back to the Chimane, um, we don't know a whole lot about immunosenescence in the Chimane, but there is some evidence of accelerated immune aging uh, in this population based on um, the earlier survey of immune function uh, across ages. So showing that naive CD4 T cells, so this is comparing Chimane to US data. The Chimane are in green, uh, the US are the sort of blue purple color. Um, and so you can see that in the Chimane, there appears to be um, a greater or a more accelerated reduction in the naive CD4 T cells uh, with age compared to uh, the US. And basically this was uh, also observed uh, in a, a study around the same time, looking at epigenetic clocks in a small sample of the Chimane compared to a white US sample. And, and basically what the study found is that when you modify the epigenetic clock to essentially upweight the contribution of immune age, uh, upweight the contribution of the T cell composition to the epigenetic age calculator, the Chimane look uh, epigenetically older compared to the US sample. But then when you modify it to downweight this contribution of immune age to epigenetic age, they look younger, uh, which fits with everything that I've just shown you so far, where if you looked at heart health, brain health, you, they look like they're aging more slowly. But then if you look at, if you try to look at immune age, it looks like they're aging more rapidly. Um, and so the health relevance of immunosenescence in the Chimane uh, is, is unknown, uh, which is important because infections are the main source of morbidity and mortality in this population. So that's going to be a topic of, of future research. Uh, and so to start wrapping all of this up, uh, summary part one of three, 
Um, the results suggest that there is some of this adiposity driven inflammation in both populations, but more so in the most of 10. Uh, it's likely pretty limited, uh, which would explain the favorable cardiometabolic health profiles. Um, at the same time, there's some evidence of infection driven inflammation being protective for cardiometabolic health, um, more so in the chimane, which again is what we'd expect based on their slightly greater pathogen burden. Um, there's also some evidence that the pathogen burden is contributing to brain aging, uh, possibly viruses in the chimane, as well as possibly helminths, but surprising that was actually in the most of 10. Um, and so future work over the next year or so uh, can test these longitudinally and, and get a better understanding of, of inflammation in relation to cardiometabolic health and brain aging. Um, and then part two, uh, so we see more of this inflammaging in the MOSA-10 compared to the Chimane. Uh, and so future work can clarify what the health relevance of this is because it's currently unknown. Um, and then there's also some evidence based on prior work of accelerated immunosenescence in the Chimane, um, which again, the health implications of this are unknown and the topic of, of future work. Uh, and then finally, the, the importance of understanding health across populations. So hopefully what my work shows is that incorporating a, a broad perspective of looking at multiple populations, experiencing different environments and lifestyles can help us better understand the factors that uh, contribute to health and aging. Uh, and so that, with that, uh, a lot of people to, to thank. This is a massive project, many collaborators across uh, numerous institutions, as well as uh, a lot of funding from National Science, Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, and so that, uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Jake, for a great talk. So we'll open up to questions. If you have questions inside the room, we'll pass around the microphone. If you have questions online, you can just go ahead and put them in the chat and then we'll read them out. Thanks, Jake. That was really great. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with just one, which is uh, the sort of what's the magnitude? You know, the magnitude of well, the last two questions actually change your mind. First one is, what's the magnitude of the effect of, um, let's say, you know, SES on immune aging, and how does that compare to actual, like, could we translate that to, like, years of aging? Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, no, because there, there are proportions, um, and so it's, it's more of, like, comparing individuals within a sample, um, so I don't think we can compare them, uh, you know, across samples. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good question. It's the comparability. Yeah, yeah like those effect sizes of looking at naive T cells to plenty, right? And mm -hmm. with respect, but like beta you know, 0.25 or whatever is that. How does that compare to whatever the age effect size is in that same model, right? Um, and the second question is in the in the Cebu work that you did, you had early life and adult life SES. Are there, you know, what we know is that our in early our environments, like social mobility is ridiculously difficult and not common, right? In most societies. Um, were there people who changed from early life to later life or in either either increasing or decreasing in terms of their SES? And could you isolate that change to look at changes in some of these, you know, immune teaching markers? Yeah, that was, so that was something that I, I looked into. Um, because that was something I was wondering. Yes, there there is limited amount of mobility. Obviously, as you expect, most people stay in the same, but there is some mobility. I looked at uh, variance inflation factors, VIFs in the model, to basically, so like, you know, a, a VIF of over three in a model is, you know, suggesting that your independent variables are, are so highly correlated that you, you have to be, you know, you should be worried interpreting those uh, coefficients. And so the VIFs for socioeconomic status at birth and adulthood was barely over one. Um, so suggesting that there is enough of this uh, separation to look at them independently. That's a great talk. Um, so I was actually looking more at the Tifani, like the, the correlation studies. I'm fairly naive when it comes to like immunology at all. Um, but when we were looking at, say, maybe these biomarkers that are more relevant for like Western populations versus the Chimai, 
Um, where do you think they would line up on that same like comparative chart with the red and blue lines? That I was. I just wanted to whether or not like the Western populations would be overlapping with them as well, or they would be significantly negatively correlated, or even something completely different. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find the slide. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, so there was a, um, this massive survey that was published in 2016, just looking at just a host of measures of immune function and inflammation comparing uh, the Chimani to US data. Um, and yeah, so like looking at CRP, for example, actually in the, in the kids, the Chimani show higher CRP uh, than in US kids, because in that case, it's being driven by infections. Um, and then in the Adults comparing the Chimani to the U.S., they're like their average CRPs are, are pretty similar. It's just the the causes are slightly different. There does seem to be in the Chimani some of that CRP does seem to be driven by adiposity, um, but a lot of it is infections. Um, whereas in the U.S., uh, it's it's almost entirely due to adiposity. So yeah, it's like the the values are the same, but their health implications are different. So in the last few years, we've been seeing uh, uh, relatively large increases in like body fat and increases in bed use Do you think that's going to be a compounding factor where having you know high helmets but also having higher obesity is that going to just skyrocket CRP or what? What do you think is going to happen with markers like that? Yeah, so there's this emerging field called immunometabolism, uh, looking at the connections between metabolic function and immune function, and not just looking at how uh, adiposity contributes to the state of chronic low-grade inflammation, but then when you do have an infection, it might actually create an exacerbated or exaggerated inflammatory response that creates as much or maybe even more damage than it is um, solving the problem. Uh, and so yeah, that dual burden is, is interesting. That's something that I, I am curious going forward. And I wonder if that's what's going on with the, the Brain Aging Association in the most attend is uh, basically is this increase in adiposity, is it contributing to excessive inflammatory responses? Um, that could be doing damage as much as it's sort of dealing with infections. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, given the overall results, and you presented very well, like the, some inflammatory markers can be high, and the person is in very good health. And in the Western, it's classically uh, associated with worth health. health. What do you think this is like telling us overall about like the causality of this inflammation related health degradation? Like have we been in the in the West like way too fast at associating causality because obviously it's not that simple. And maybe the follow-up would be given of the causal pathways that you uh, have in mind, would you expect a linear relationship between parasitism and health? Or at some point when the parasites are eating too much of the blood glucose or whatever other nutrients, you should expect health to plummet once again. And so have you tried non-linear battery? Maybe too much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, right. So immediately I this is a great example of looking at BMI, for example. Um, so the people who had the highest IL6 were the people who either had really low or really high BMIs. Um, yeah, people in the middle had the lowest IL-6. So yeah, there's overnutrition, high BMI, elevating IL-6. Um, but then if the IL-6 is being driven by infections and it contributes to malnutrition. So yeah, um, definitely. Uh, there can be some, there is evidence of this nonlinear association. Um, the, the other topic of causality um, sort of plays uh, just generally in studying immune function, like is, is it, is, immune, is inflammation a cause or consequence of, of health? Um, so yeah, I'm curious one day we're trying to get into Mendelian randomization to try and get a causality because um, these are cross-sectional associations. So there's no way you can really infer uh, causality, but yeah, Mendelian randomization is interesting. So you can use genetic variants to see if you, know, if you produce more of an inflammatory response just because you're genetically predisposed, does that also then predict some health outcome? Um, so that's something I'm, I'm interested in uh, going forward.
All right, any final questions? Well, in that case, uh, thank you so much, Dave, for a great talk.